Welcome to the Chicago Golf Report Podcast. I was 14 years old, kind of got into golf and uh, started playing with my buddies and uh, fell in love with putters for whatever reason. Not, not sure. Um, I was a good putter back in the day, so I uh, still am now, but that's kind of how I fell in love with the putter world and um, always wanted something different than my buddies. Uh, wanted to have that cool something different. And, uh, you know, Tiger won the 97 Masters using a Scotty Cameron Terillium. And uh, at the time, you know, I think they were like 250 bucks. Uh, really wanted one, wanted to have something that uh, my buddies didn't have. Convinced my dad to let me borrow some money to buy one. He thought it was a bad idea <laughs> and uh, took that putter and uh, actually ended up selling it to a collector in uh, Japan and made a little money on it and started flipping Scotty Camerons from an early age collectible ones, handmade ones from uh, Scotty's early days, and um, really just dove into like that, that side of the golf world, uh, pre-eBay, pre-all that stuff, um, you know, using like golf web classifieds. Uh, the 90s were a weird time on uh, online for buying and selling uh, collectible golf equipment. There wasn't, wasn't a, um, the same market there is today. And uh, I continued doing that, um, ended up uh, doing demo days for Titleist um, when I was when I was a little bit older. Always worked at the golf course um, and just continued doing it uh, all the way through college as a kind of like a side gig. Um, then uh, you know while I was in college, I, I was known as this guy who could get rare and hard to find Scotty Cameron items. Um, nobody really knew who I was. They just you know had a name online and ended up becoming um, kind of like the the go to guy to get something from Japan and um, was offered a job to open up a, a store called The Art of Putters in West L.A. Uh, as one of Scotty Cameron's distributors um, with another guy named Rand who uh, decided that this was a, you know, a great opportunity for us to kind of continue building out that market, making um, collectible one-off putters, um, you know, kind of through the back channels of the Scotty Cameron community and uh, ran that for uh, three and a half, four years before I moved back to Chicago and ended up getting introduced to Bob Bettinardi. Uh, spent nine and a half years running Tour Stock Putters, which was uh, a distributor for Bettinardi, uh, but I also was doing design and you know, polishing, painting. I kind of did everything. Um, opened up, help opened up the Korea market for Bettinardi Golf. And, um, you know, all along the way, had all these ideas for, for what, you know, inevitably became swag, but those ideas kind of fell on deaf ears throughout my career. And uh, a good friend of mine said, Hey, it's like, it's time that you go do this. You should do this on your own. Like these are good ideas. You know, the, the demographic, the age group out there is what, is what, um, you know, what you know best. And uh, I started swag. <laughs> so the way you describe it, it, it all makes sense, right? Looking back now on your career, it's like you were into collectibles, side of golf which is somewhat unique for a long time even before you start it you get in the golf business you find Bettinardi, you do all these things it's like it all set up and then you were starting to feel this urge to do something akin to swag and then you kind of get the impetus from your friend to take the leap now when you took the leap was there i guess i guess looking back on swag now where it's been what's different from what you kind of thought it might be to what it has become kind of still at an early stage. Yeah. I mean, it's honestly much bigger than I ever expected it to be. You know, I, 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 I guess I, I'd even go back to say like, even when I was younger, as my friends were, you know, collecting like baseball cards or Pokemon or something else, I was already, I guess at another echelon of collectibles with, with the golf space. And I wanted to create a brand that I thought was, you know, akin to something like a, um, like a Jordan shoe drop, right? Where small batches, really cool stuff. We're never going to make it again. Or if we do, it's going to be a new colorway or, you know, something like that. And, um, you know, my grand plan was uh, to kind of create this little niche community of, of collectors, but it just turns out that what I was designing and what we were making was appealing to a much broader, you know, group of people. It wasn't just the 25 to 35 year olds that were buying our products. We had, teenagers we had 65 year old you know seven year old guys that thought it was cool 
and you know wanted to maybe feel young again with some of the nostalgia plays we were doing and other things so um it has just blossomed into something much bigger than uh, i honestly could have ever hoped so when i first got to meet uh, most of the people from swag a, a few weeks ago at canal shores i got to meet anthony who's with your events group and he mm -hmm. was talking about all the different events that you do but before that he kind of mentioned the partnerships can you talk a little bit about you have some really unique and powerful partnerships with like the WWE, which you're able to then create product lines from. How did you come up with that idea? You know, um, really not any much differently than just the ideas that I had for swag to start. Right. Um, some things that maybe people wouldn't necessarily put as a as a golf product. So, you know, I don't I don't think anybody was thinking, hey, someone should go out and make a Jake the Snake head cover or a Hollywood Hogan head cover. And my thought process was, hey, you know, every not not everybody, but there's a ton of people that golf, right? Um, if you are into WWE wrestling, why wouldn't you want a WWE head cover on your on your bag? If you are um, obviously if you're into college sports or MLB or NFL, it's a little bit different. Those are those are much you know more common these days. But trying to find some of the things, uh, garbage pail kids, things that I thought had a big collectors community, something that um, nobody had tapped into as far as uh, the golf space goes. You know, it, it all makes sense too, because a lot of these things that you're talking about, it's part of our identity, at least from mm -hmm. a guy's perspective. It's like, that's, you know, I, I'm a WWE guy. I'm a Hollywood Hogan guy. You know, it's these little nuggets, right? We're, we're a lot of different things, but it's those pieces of identity that you're kind of proud to wear. And if you could create something like a, a cool club head cover, it, you're, you're able to broadcast that to your buddies and on the golf course and it just seems like there's all kinds of opportunities within that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities. And I think that those markets are, you know, relatively untapped in the golf space still to this day. Um, and, and the truth is, it's not necessarily that easy to go about getting some of those licensing deals because um, I'll use WWE as the as the poster child for it. It was a it was a very long process to convince them that, you know, this is a good idea because nobody had ever really reached out to them to say, we want to make, you know, head covers for WWE. And um, I think that that way of thinking is, you know, the same thing when it came to whether it was the neon dollar bill or our, you know, one of our like the face head covers. One of the, one of the things that's kind of unique to swag, um, all those ideas maybe don't appeal to everybody, but it's not about appealing to everybody. It's appealing to each group of individuals and making something cool for them. The other component of it, so you have sort of like this collectible component, right, with a more of a defined amount of product that you have to sell. But the other side of the coin is it's the quality, right? And mm -hmm. it seems like the swag brand is more of a, a high quality brand, right? You're creating high quality, not only head covers, but really high quality putters, which is mm -hmm. kind of akin to like the Bettinardi model where you're you're not at the bottom, you're at the top. Um, is that something that has been dictated by the market or is that kind of like, you know, you thought initially we're going to be a high quality brand? Yeah, just just my own wants. Right. I, I wanted to make something that I felt, you know, would kind of stand the test of time. So when it came to the head covers, you know, we we acquired an embroidery company, um, EP Embroidery in, in Atlanta, because uh, I felt they were making the best products at the time. Um, you know, it was it was I wanted to make as much stuff in the U.S. as possible. Um, it's not that easy these days to do that. So finding, you know, finding the ability to do that was very important to me. And, uh, you know, really just I, I wanted it to feel like a high quality product. Right. You know, you can you can buy some really cheap head covers and they they just don't hold up. And I, that was that for me was like just a big thing. Like, I want to feel like you're getting what you paid for. So talk a little bit about your putters, too. You've got a pretty diverse line of putters and really unique. Can you talk about what goes into creating a new line of putters, how you go about it? Yeah, so when I when I started Swag, the idea was that uh, I wanted to mill a putter start to finish, uh, which was, at the time, I don't believe anybody in the golf industry was doing it. Um, I think some people are attempting it now. Maybe some people are doing it the same way we are, but we were kind of really one of the first where the goal was that there was going to be zero hand polishing that goes into these putters. Um, it took us nine and a half months to program and design the first model, um, which is an extremely long time for uh, a putter. Uh, you know, people were spending 45, competitors were spending 45 minutes, maybe an hour machining. We were spending, you know, almost two and a half times that. And that was just for the machining, let alone the engraving. The engraving itself takes a really long time with the intricate engravings that we do. Um, it was just one of those things where, again, I wanted to 
put everything I could into the product. I wanted to, I wanted to come out looking different. I wanted to, I want someone to be able to feel it. Who is a putter nut and look at it and say, Hey, this is, this is special. There's, there's a lot of work that goes into this. And I wanted to be able to replicate it time and time again, without having to worry about, you know, whether it's me polishing or one of the guys in the back polishing, um, not, it's not, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but, um, inconsistencies can happen, right? It's just natural when there's a human element involved. I wanted to eliminate that from the process. So it's one thing to have a really cool idea. It's one thing to create a really nice product, but the, the intersection comes when can you meet the market? Can you get in front of the people who you want to do that with and sell your products to? What was sort of the, the, the ignition to get swag going? When did you kind of see that first spark of, oh, I, I think people are interested in this? Um, you, well, you know what? I mean, I kind of knew people were interested for a long time because I had the ideas and um, you know, I guess through my friends groups or just the people I've known through the golf industry along the way, um, I'd shared some of this stuff with them and they just, you know, I never had anybody go, this is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and it's one of those things where I guess I just needed that. I needed that, um, that reason to do it. And I guess the reason was I was tired of always doing something for someone else and just wanted to do it on my own. So I brought together a group of guys and I said, Hey guys, I'm, I'm going for it. You want, you want to part, you know, do you want to be partners in this? And most of them had knew nothing about the golf space and they said a trust that I knew what I was talking about because I'd spent 14 years doing it. Plus, you know, as a kid kind of just delving into the collectible side of it, and I go, um, this is, this is the plan. I don't know if it's going to work, but let's, let's, you know, let's give it a go. And, um, we just found like instant, you know, instantly the, the collector, the collector group that was out there fell in love with the brand. They just thought it was super cool and unique. The designs were, way different than anybody else was doing back then. And, you know, there's a lot of copycats now trying to do the stitch counts and the, and the high quality work, but still it's, it's very hard to replicate what we're doing just because we're so far ahead of the, of the competition as far as having manufacturing here and uh, our design team is top notch. So one of the ways that you reach these people, especially the collectors, I heard that you have like these collector events where, yep. where you get, get collectors together can you talk a little bit about the your focus? Like, how, how do you come up with the ideas for the events, not only with the collectors, but broad reach, too? Because I know you've been at PGA Tour events, too. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, just just trying to reach different demographics, different groups of people. So the idea was that uh, when when I was collecting Scotty Camerons and when I was working at Benton Art and Scotty Cameron, we did collectors events. But it was always for, like, the, you know, top 30 guys, right, or the top 40 guys. And to me, there's a whole group of people that um, are super passionate, love the brands, but don't have access to those events because they're not a top spender. And we still do top spender events and, you know, like kind of like the, the top echelon groups. But um, the idea was that, hey, we should do some kind of open invites where maybe you just want to figure out what swag is for the first time. And you haven't, you haven't, you know, you haven't put, you've just dipped your toe in the water, you bought a head cover, but you're not really sure. Um, get them around a whole bunch of other guys that are really into the brand. Um, all over the country, different locations, and let people meet each other. And I think that the community is pretty much, you know, it's, it's like it's like one A and one B. One A is the product, right, and our designs, but one B is the community. We need we need a great community for the product to, you know, really stand the test of time with, um, you know, with the golf space. Uh, so another thing that you have that's really unique, it, I guess it's not unique, but it is unique to the golf business, is you have like a drop calendar of mm -hmm. when the new designs are coming out, and it, it's genius because it creates this, it, it, to me, it, it creates this, this interest, this excitement, like we have something to look forward to, you know, and you could see that with NTFs and all kinds of things. That's, that's where we're going. But in the golf business, it's unique somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, how much is it the drop calendar? How much of that is the, how much does that help uh, increase demand for the products? So when we started the business, uh, when I started the business, we had no drop calendar. We actually just like did surprise drops all the time. And as we grew and, you know, more people, I guess, were the best way to put it is they were annoyed at the fact that they didn't know when the next drop was because, you know, you're at work, you're whatever, on vacation with your family. And all of a sudden you get a notification or you see an Instagram post and you miss a drop. So we kind of instituted this drop calendar a couple of year, years ago in order to give people a heads up that, hey, something new is coming. And that doesn't mean we're not doing any surprise drops anymore. We're not doing some of the things that we used to do from the beginning, but it's again, just a kind of a way to say, Hey guys, be aware. There's something new coming out, you know, next week or mm -hmm. next month or whenever the, the next drop is. Um, but you know, we've, we're, we're dropping something almost every week, um, which is hard to do. <laughs> and 
uh, I think giving people the heads up of like kind of what's coming soon is also good because I actually don't really want people buying something for the sake of buying it. I want them to buy it because they think it's cool. Um, and I think that's part of the uh, evolution of our brand is that, you know, early on it was buy it because it's there. Um, but I didn't make the Hollywood Hogan cover for everyone. I bought it. I made it for the WWE fans. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the the goal is that we're making enough variety of stuff so that every group of people has a chance to get something. And fortunately, we're in the position now where we can make more of it. We, we weren't really able to do that in the early days. We just didn't have the infrastructure to do it. So a couple people that you've partnered with um, are Paige Sporanek and Nick Hardy. So Nick mm -hmm. Hardy's the prominent uh, local Chicago golfer. Um, won a tournament last year. Um, how did you kind of decide that these were two of the folks that you wanted to help rep the brand of swag? Uh, well, Paige early on to me was a no brainer. Um, bold brand, you know, in your face brand. Paige was the OG Instagram golf girl. She, um, at the time, and I, I still actually think now had more followers than anybody else in the golf space. Um, you know, more than Tiger or Rory or anybody. And it just seemed like the, the, the no brainer move. Uh, let's get somebody who's got the most eyes on them to be the, you know, one of the faces of our brand to, you know, post about our products and let more people know who we are. Um, you know, we, we love working with her. She's, she's amazing. Then Nick Hardy was also just kind of a, a no brainer in the fact that local from Northbrook, our, our headquarters are in Northbrook. And it just felt like a, a perfect synergy because we were looking for that again, that little bit younger demographic up and coming PGA tour player, uh, wasn't afraid of the bold colors and, you know, carrying a neon yellow staff bag, doing the things that um, not not every player is open to doing, um, you know, had to make him a putter from scratch, but but trusted that I knew what I was doing with Nate, my uh, my PGA Tour rep. And uh, together we were able to make him a putter that he was super happy with. And, you know, he supports the brand top to bottom, head covers, bag and putter. So uh, two more questions. Uh, one, you just kind of mentioned about the whole world of golf influencers. So we had the Creator Classic, yep. which was last week. We've had a lot of different events where these golf influencers, like you said, their audience is much bigger than what even broadcasters get. People mm -hmm. on the PGA Tour broadcast don't have anywhere near the reach of a page. How has that impacted your brand? Because it seems like this is, uh, it's, it's certainly a different direction that the golf industry has gone into where now these influencers have this massive reach. Has that helped the swag brand considering where, who you're trying to reach? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that social media in general kind of became the great equalizer in the golf space. You know, the, the large OEMs um, have very deep pockets. And when these new, you know, upstart brands are, are coming to the scene, it's, it's really hard to compete with, uh, you know, a title is a tailor made a Callaway, right? It's, it's almost impossible. So having the ability to reach really the same amount of people through social media, at least, um, is, is, is a lever that was massive for swag because all of a sudden we were reaching 4 million people through, you know, pages, Instagram, right? Um, I could have never done that 15 years ago. So then to, to finish up, you know, the way you describe it as we're able to look back on it, it's just, it all makes sense, right? It seems that you're, history, where you came from, your interests. It's almost like the universe said, Nick, this is the path you should follow. And now it's kind of laid out and swag's done really well. What's What has surprised you as you've gotten to this point in the business? Um, because it certainly seems like things have worked out really well, but you're always, as a business owner, you're prepared for the worst thing, right? You have to kind of look to see your competitors and all that. What has surprised you in this time? Um, honestly, the thing that surprised me the most, I think, is I actually started the business to be a putter company, and it just happened that the head covers were so cool they just took off, and I was more than willing to <laughs> to kind of change course and make sure that head covers kind of became a big part of what we do. But um, I'm still I'm just super passionate about the putter side of what we do, and um, I'm really hopeful that in the next year or two, as we continue kind of telling our story about the putters and why we do things the way we do, we get more people into the putters themselves. Um, it's something that, uh, my, you know, again, it's my passion. It's something that I want people to be aware that we make an unbelievable putter. And it's something that we haven't really been able to tell the story of the right way, more so because I've been a little afraid to kind of show the techniques and the things that we do. But now that we've grown them and I feel like the, you know, the brand's in a good space, I, I think it's time that we really start kind of sharing those details and, and what makes us special from a putter perspective.